All right, I think we'll probably get started here. We might have a few other people kind of trickle in, but that's all right. Um, I want to start off by saying that my name is Patrick. I work for Chenard. This will be my third season here at Chenard's. Um, I help in the houseplant department a lot, but you'll see me kind of running around outside and doing some other stuff as well. Um, I'm a third year horticulture student at Oregon State University. I also work for the OSU Ornamental Plant Breeding Program. So a lot of our um, work there is we breed hibiscus plants and butterfly bush and a couple other um, common shrubs that you'll see eventually kind of in your yard um, and for sale at our garden centers and stuff like that. Um, I think, and I've also been growing orchids for about eight years. So that's, yeah. So if I, I hope that you guys will learn something today. Uh, feel free um, as I'm talking to raise your hand. Um, we can ask questions. And then if you're on Zoom, uh, feel free to put questions in the chat for me. Um, I can answer those. We can also talk um, Zoom or in person after class if you guys want to talk about a specific situation that you have um, or anything like that as well. All right. Uh, I am going to start with a couple questions. How many people can keep orchids alive? Okay, that's a good start. That's really good. How about reblooming? Have we gotten orchids to rebloom before? Okay, perfect. See, this is it's, that's good. <laughs> There's yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that today. And you know, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you know, I'm here to help you with that as well. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of reasons and ways to encourage reblooming um, and growing nice, full, healthy plants as well. It's not really that much different from growing house plants. If you have experience with that, they just like a little bit, you know, different, um, a little slightly different care. So um, orchids are known around the world for their beautiful, long lasting flowers, obviously, but caring for them can be elusive to some people. Um, most orchids that you find in garden centers or grocery stores can easily be grown in your house. Um, you don't really need to do a lot of extra things for them. You might have to have, no, you don't need to change your environment or anything like that most, most of the time. Um, orchids are part of the Orchidaceae family, so they have their own family named after them in the plant world. Um, there's over 28,000 orchid species. It's one of the largest plant species there is, um, and they're found in every habitat and continent in the world except for Antarctica. So um, there's a wide variety of different orchids. Like we were talking about earlier, there's some hardy orchids that you can actually grow outside here in your yard, um, but we're going to focus today mostly on house plants. Um, I want to switch over. Uh, I'm going to say a couple terms today, and I don't want you guys to be lost. We're going to talk about, well, let's see, get this out of the way so you guys can actually see the pictures. Okay, perfect. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple different orchid anatomy terms. Um, that's going to depend, that's going to change based on what their care is and stuff like that. The first picture that you see is pointing to a pseudobulb is what it's called. Uh, those are generally storage organs that orchids have. They keep water and nutrients in there. So if they go through a drought or if they can't find nutrients, it's they've got a backup, basically. It's a lot like a tulip bulb where it holds all the nutrients and it holds what it needs to flower, uh, but it's just above the ground instead. The next picture is a cane. Um, canes are very similar. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but I've got one right here I can actually show you. Um, so this would be what is considered a cane. Um, it does the same thing as a suitable. It's just a different shape. Here, I'll show our Zoom people too. This is a cane right here. Um, it's again, a storage organ. As the organ grows for suitables and for canes, it will produce new ones every year. Um, and most orchids that grow in that way um, rebloom from the new growth. They don't rebloom on the old growth. So you wouldn't be expecting blooms from any of the old suitables or any of the old canes. Um, so the goal to get to get to reblooming with those is to get a mature new suitable or cane for that kind of orchid. Um, the next one that I'm gonna talk about that most people are probably familiar with is called fans. Um, you can see this in a lot of different orchids. Uh, Phalaenopsis, which is a really common grocery store moth orchid. Um, also in Pathiopetalums or slipper orchids, they grow in fans. And there's some other um, similar orchids that grow that way as well. Basically means that they grow on a stem and they don't grow pseudobulbs. Their stem is the main growth point and they send out new growth from the top. Um, blooms will come from inside the stem in between the leaves. Um, so a couple new leaves will mature each year and every section is a place for a bloom to possibly come out. It's not, not every section will do that because it causes it takes a lot of energy to do that, but that is where new blooms can come. Um, you can also see that with banded orchids too, which we have as well, uh, but they grow in a, in a uh, on stem and a fan kind of shape. So that is the most common that most, most people are familiar with. They don't know necessarily that it's called fans, but um, if I refer to, if I use that word, I just wanted you guys to know um, what it means. I met this person. All right. 
Um, we're going to move on to some selections for different types of orchids that we've got. Um, like I said, originally, Phalaenopsis. It's the really common grocery store orchid that you see everywhere. Um, really easy to take care of. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, another selection that we've got um, includes Cattleya type orchids. Um, this is a Cattleya, or it's actually a Rinko stylus or Rinko Cattleya, which is a hybrid between a couple different species. Um, but the care is the same for that orchid. Um, so that would be Cattleya type orchids. Dendrobiums are going to be the ones that you see here with the really tall, long flower spikes. Um, also cane growers. Um, a lot of people use those for lays, actually. So if you ever go to Hawaii, um, the lays are usually made out of dendrobium orchid flowers, which is cool. Um, we've got Oncidium types and their hybrids. The Oncidium world is quite a big um, group of plants. These two bottom pictures here are both Oncidium types. Um, you can sometimes find those in grocery stores, sometimes in Trader Joe's. So Trader Joe's gets some cool orchids sometimes. Um, but Oncidiums are really common. They're usually very fragrant. Um, and they usually can do multiple spikes at once, which is really cool. If you got a mature plant, especially, you can usually get, you know, four or five spikes at a time, which is awesome. Uh, another selection is slipper orchids, that one really funky looking orchid in that top corner there with the pouch in it. Those are slipper orchids. Um, you can see those sometimes again at grocery stores, Trader Joe's, I've gotten a couple there, but some nurseries will get them in, we'll get them in sometimes. It just is what's available to us at the time. Um, but those are really easy to grow in the house as well. The top right corner picture right there is actually a vanilla orchid, which we do have on the corner of that table right there. Um, mm -hmm. Vanilla orchids are vi tropical vines. They've got really waxy, thick cuticles. They grow up trees. Um, once they're about three feet in length, they can bloom. That's about mature size. They need to be mature to flower. Um, but that's actually where all vanilla bean comes from, is from the vanilla orchid. Um, not everyone knows that. And they're grown in the tropics and they're all hand pollinated. By, so each that's why vanilla can get expensive because it's very labor intensive to actually get the seed pod, which is after it flowers, it produces a seed pod and that's where you get vanilla bean. Um, cymbidiums, you see those in, or in stores sometimes as well, that bottom right corner, um, there's, they come in a variety of colors and they're really big orchids. They can get, you know, like three or four feet tall. Um, the flower spikes can get, you know, just as tall or even taller and they're really thick, heavy flowers. Um, and they're winter bloomers. So you, say, uh, you will see them a little bit more this time of year. Um, Ludicia, that's kind of a, not everyone knows that these are orchids, but we do get them in sometimes. They're also known as jewel orchids. Um, they're more grown for their leaves. They're usually, they come in either green um, with a dark red pattern or like almost a black green um, with really um, glittery stripes. They have really kind of boring flowers. They're just white and they're small. Um, but people grow them for their foliage because they're super glittery and super pretty. Um, and we do go get those in actually quite frequently. We don't have any right now, but um, those will normally be in our houseplant section out there. Um, they're not necessarily always with our orchids because they're really, they just treat them like a normal houseplant. So, um, and I think that's all for the selection or um, that we, that I try to talk about common ones that you see are ones that we will have in store for you. Um, and then we're going to kind of go into general care and stuff like that for those guys. Um, this is one of the key pieces to growing orchids successfully, I would say. Um, you cannot put most orchids in potting soil. Um, it will rot their roots. Hi there, come on in. <laughs> I got a handout for you as well too. Um, yeah, like I was saying, the orchid growing media, they grow generally on trees or in leaf mulch or in bark in the forest. Um, and so that is gonna really determine what you wanna plant them in. Terrestrial orchids is the terrestrial is the word meaning that they grow in the ground. Um, so they're going to want less airflow, more moisture because uh, they're growing in the ground. Epiphytic orchids is another name. Most orchids, I would say, are epiphytic. They grow on trees and they will grow like on palm trees. You know, like they got that fiber in there. So that it does keep some moisture in there, uh, but it's very, you know, lots of wind, very airy. The sun hits them. Um, so they like a lot of airflow to their roots. And then there's also other terms like lithophyte. Um, which means they grow on rocks. Um, and you know, some, some of these terms can, are interchangeable and some will grow on trees and rocks or et cetera. So knowing kind of if you have a terrestrial orchid or an epiphytic orchid is important to make sure um, that you're planting it in the correct media. Terrestrial orchids, like I said, prefer more moisture retention than they did, and they don't need as much airflow. So a mix of potting soil and orchid bark or moss and orchid bark, more moss than orchid bark or more potting soil than orchid bark is ideal. 
Um, it keeps that moisture in there really well and it mimics their natural habitat. Epiphytic orchids, like I said, prefer really good airflow around the roots. Um, they're very prone to root rot. So most of our orchids you're gonna see are planted in a mixture of orchid bark and moss and perlite. Um, what I do is I'll generally do about 50% orchid bark, 25 moss, 25 perlite. The perlite keeps the moss nice and fluffy, doesn't compact it, which is great. And the orchid bark provides that extra airflow as well. Most orchid bark doesn't really hold a lot of moisture. Newer orchid bark might, but as it gets older and breaks down, it tends to become hydrophobic. Um, so that's a reason to repot. But again, we'll talk about repotting and stuff in a little bit. Um, this picture that I have on the screen also shows what a mounted orchid is. You can see these, you know, sometimes in stores. They're not super common. You can do it yourself as a craft. I don't know if you guys have ever mounted staghorns or seen the ferns that grow on the wood. Um, it's very similar to that. It's just to mimic the tree growing on a tree. Um, it's common for a lot of orchids that are really prone to root rot. A lot of the ones we would talk about, it's not, you don't have to do it, but it's just a different way to kind of display it as well. Um, the way you would water that is you would just soak it, you know, every couple of days, especially in the summer, maybe every day. Um, this orchid right here, this is it's a banda type orchid. They, you can see there's not much in here. It's just it's just a little plastic basket and some orchid bark, and then they're all in both, both the roots are going to be hanging. Um, so this is something that you would soak every couple of days. Um, it's very similar to how you would grow a matcha orchid, but they like a lot of airflow. Um, so this is a pretty common way you'll see those grown in baskets or just with nothing, it was just roots. Sometimes people put even like Spanish moss. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's the it's an air plant that actually grows like in Florida. It's super, it looks like lichen, really long, stringy lichen. Uh, people will put that on the roots and that actually helps keep the moisture, but still get really good airflow. So that's a fun way to display it too. Not everyone likes the look of roots. So I mean, having that on there kind of makes it look a little nicer as well. Um, I think we'll move on to repotting. That's this is going to be kind of the the bulky the bulkiest section of the class, I would say. Um, this can intimidate a lot of people, and that's okay. We we actually offer a repotting service here. So I mean, if you ever want to walk through it with us, or if you just want us to do it for you, we can do it here um, for a small fee. Um, that's that's listed in the store. But I'm gonna we're gonna talk about it today too. I'm gonna teach you guys how to do it as well. Um, repotting. It's important to remove as much as the old media as possible. So, I mean, when you're repotting a normal plant, you don't always clean all the soil off. Um, but with orchids, that's something that you really want to do. Um, orchid bark and moss can both become acidic, which can actually in turn create a bad, you know, pH for the roots and it can rot the roots in turn. Um, so removing as much of the old media as possible is really important to kind of prevent any acidity buildup or any salt buildup as well. Um, Watering and soaking your plant ahead of time, you know, putting it in a bucket and letting the roots sit in water for like 15 to 20 minutes before you repot it is really helpful. It'll make the bark and the roots swell so they'll be less attached because the orchid roots, like I said, they grow on trees, so they, they grab on stuff really easily and you're putting it in these little bark chips. Um, and so putting that in there, getting the bark chips moist will help them break off. It'll help the roots swell and not be as um, breakable, which is a good way. So um, soaking them is really a good way to kind of prevent any root breakage as you repot, which is good. Um, it is common for orchids to lose roots over time. They do, a lot of the cattleyas will actually kill off old roots. So it's pretty common, especially after a repot. Um, but as you know, you wanna kind of repot as new growth is starting. Um, for Phalaenopsis, it'll keep the roots kind of growing in the new media for cattleyas and anything with pseudobulbs or canes, um, it'll make sure that those roots kind of dig in there. Hi there. <laughs> I've, no, it's okay. I've got a handout for you too, really quick that you can take home today. Which yeah, of course. Heading to the coast rather than. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, all right. As I was saying for the cattleyas and stuff like that, um, removing, you know, any dead roots and where dead roots look like that picture on the end there, you can kind of see. So this is a live root, and it looks a lot like the roots you see kind of here on the table. Um, and this stuff, the papery looking soft, and like the, it peels off the middle piece, that's dead. It's kind of how you can tell. The vellum is what it's called, the outer part of that root will kind of peel off of that. Um, and that's how you can kind of tell it's a dead root. And that you'll just want to trim off um, all the way back to where it's either alive again or just where it's, it'll, if it's dead all the way up, just trim the whole thing off. Um, any rotting material you want to trim off or get out of there. Um, like I said, that'll make the media acidic as well. Um, so that's really important. Um, for pot size, 
this can be difficult for some people. You don't want to go too big um, just because, you know, orchids are prone to root rot if they um, have too much extra media or they stay wet for too long because they need that airflow. Um, so you only want to go about an inch or two larger than what it's in already if it's full. Um, if it's not full, it can go back in the same size pot or you can downsize it. Sometimes if you buy orchids from the grocery store or from Home Depot, the pot will be like way too big um, and that can cause root rot. So when you pot it, you might actually have to downsize it. Um, just kind of look at the root mass that you have um, as you do that. Um, we do sell orchid pots. Um, orchid pots are a little bit different than normal pots because they've usually got slits or holes in them to kind of you know aid in that airflow. Um, you don't need orchid pots for your terrestrial orchids um, or orchids that like more moisture. Um, but for, you know, like our dendrobiums and our cat lids, orchid pots are generally good. We also sell a class. We sell these nice clay, very pretty versions. Um, just consider that if you put an orchid in that clay pot, it's going to be really hard to get out of, especially if it grows roots through the holes. So be ready for a fight if you put it in there. Uh, the plastic pots are a little bit different. They've got usually slits on the bottom, and sometimes they have slits on the side as well. And we usually sell those, but we're out of stock right now. But they should be coming this week. Um, I generally like to put my orchids in the clear plastic pots and then put them in a clay pot because um, it. some of them are really top heavy. As you can see, the syndrobiums fall over, so that's why they're in those pots. Um, but it also just makes it look nicer. Um, Clear pots are great if you're starting out because you can see the roots, um, if see if they're healthy, if they look like they're rotting. Um, you can kind of gauge how much water you need to do because you can see if the soil's wet in the inside, which is great. Um, so if you're starting out, clear plastic pots are really easy and they're really good indicators for watering and stuff like that. Um, like I said too, be careful when you pick pot size. They don't necessarily mind being root bound and orchids should be repotted generally every two to three years. That's usually how long the media lasts. Um, if it's really, really big and it's outgrowing its pot, you might want to do it before then because the longer you wait, it's going to be a lot harder to kind of get it out of that pot, if that makes sense. Um, a quick question. Yeah. So if there's roots coming out, yes. is the goal to have them in the pot? Is that the That's a good question. question. Not necessarily. So sometimes you'll get an orchid, especially phalaenopsis, people will get roots that kind of are growing straight up in the air. Um, that's really common and they're called aerial roots. Um, because they grow on trees, they're just looking for something to grab onto. Um, it's really normal. I wouldn't, some people like to cut them off. I would not cut them off because if you ever have a root issue in that pot and all the roots die, you've got a backup plan, which is great. Um, but if they're growing out of the soil and they're happy, I would leave them. Um, if you put them directly into the soil, they're gonna be put into a higher moisture environment that they're not used to. Um, which can cause some rot for those aerial roots in the long run, and then it'll spoil your media. So if they have aerial roots, it's fine. Um, if you have a root issue and you want to try and put those in the pot, you know, that is when you would kind of try to convert them. Um, but I would just leave them. Okay. Yeah. Um, when orchids are flowering, I would not repot them. It can cause some shock. Um, it can also cause bud blast or bud drop. So if, unless you absolutely have to repot um, your orchid if, because you get it from the store and it's all gross or it smells bad or there's flies or something, I would let it kind of finish its blooming period and then give it a repot um, or wait till you see some new growth if it doesn't need to be repotted right away. Um, that'll kind of keep the orchid, give it time to adjust to its new environment and then give it time to adjust to its new potting media after it's, um, it's kind of settled in a little bit more. Uh, fertilizer is something that I, overlooked for a long time in houseplants, orchids, my outdoor plants. But truthfully, especially in the orchid world, fertilizer is like really key um, to kind of getting them to rebloom again. If you think about it, you're putting them in, you know, just moss and just tree bark. And so there's not a lot going on in there. There's not really a lot of decomposition like what happens outside. There's no leaf litter going in, there's no worms. Um, so nutrients aren't being added to the soil media. So you kind of have to supplement that in the, in, you know, in the wild, you know, leaves fall on the trees, you know, birds poop on them, like lots of crazy stuff happens and it just doesn't happen in your house. Uh, so supplemental fertilizer is really important to get reblooms to happen uh, for a lot of orchids, I would say. We have a couple different options. We've got those two liquid ones at the end there. Um, you can also do a slow release fertilizer, which I like to do and you liquid fertilizer at the same time. The slow release you put in like every three to six months and it's great because you can forget about it and it just will um, slowly let nutrients in every time you water. Um, if you want it to rebloom, you know, the liquid, you can do the, both of them, or you can just do the liquid or just the slow release. It's kind of up to you to kind of experiment. I would just say follow the directions on the fertilizer that you buy. If you don't, it can kind of lead to salt buildup. 
or root burn or other fertilizer burns on the foliage. Um, so just be considerate of that and make sure that you're following the directions on the fertilizer. Uh, also, I would say in the wintertime here, uh, fertilizer is not as important, but I mean, a lot of our orchids do bloom in the wintertime. So, you know, you can kind of take, you can kind of lay off a little bit in the winter when they're blooming um, and then kind of pick it back up again as, you know, as the flowers fade. Because um, <clears throat> if they're putting a bunch of extra energy into new growth, they might kind of just kill off the flowers. So I would say lay off the fertilizer when you see, you know, flowers beginning to form um, and then, you know, pick it back up again in the springtime because most of our orchids here will bloom in the winter. So we're gonna talk about pests and stuff next. Everybody's favorite topic, really gross and things like that. Um, these are pictures up on our up on the screen here of some really common uh, houseplant pests that all orchids can get. Um, spider mites, mealybugs, aphids, scales, thrips, and other, and red spider mites is a different kind of thing or false spider mite is also what it's called. Uh, Two-spotted spider mites tend to form webbing on the plants, and this, it'll cause kind of pitting and discoloration on the leaves. If you feel the leaves, they tend to be dusty. Um, if you're seeing any of that, I would look and see if there's any webbing, or if you can see any, even of the little mites, you can kind of see them here strung along the webs. It's really hard, I know, but um, they're really tiny little dots and just move like super slowly. Um, that's an indication that you have spider mites. Mealybugs really, really like um, orchid flowers. So you won't really always see mealybugs on the plant, but I mean, if your flowers are starting to bloom, sometimes they love to be kind of just up in the bud or right behind the flower or like right in the middle of the flower. Um, there's lots of sugars and stuff going into the flower for nectar production and stuff like that. And so they just sit in there and they suck all the juices out and it can shorten your flower life and also cause deformed looking flowers. Um, same with aphids, they do the same thing. They love flower buds. Uh, as you know, with roses and stuff like that, it's a very similar kind of thing. Um, they suck those sugars out of there. If you see any sticky residue, any fluffy, cottony looking spots, um, ants can be an indicator of aphids as well um, on your plant. So just look out for that. Um, scale, you won't know, you'll see on stems and underside leaves. I've seen them on Phalaenopsis before, kind of all over the leaves. Um, they just look like a little pimple kind of on the leaf or a bump that you can just scrape off normally. Um, that's a picture down there of a really, really big one, but they can be a lot smaller. So uh, look out for that. They also, they kind of latch on and they suck the juices out of the plant. So you'll see pitting, discoloration, same kind of thing. Thrips are really, really hard to identify. Um, we've been seeing them a lot more in the valley recently as the weather has been getting warmer and drier because they like hot, dry climates. So they'll come in your house in the wintertime through the doors, you know, any, you know, through windows on you, if you even if you don't know. Uh, other plants that you bring into your house as well. So thrips can be really hard to see. They look like really long, thin bugs with wings. They can be green, black, white, gray. Um, if they, if you go to your plant and you kind of touch it and you see things jumping or flying off the plant, that's a really good indicator uh, of thrips. So be careful. Thrips are not good to have because they can jump and fly to your other plants as well. Um, aphids and scale and mealybugs don't normally do that, which is great. So if you've got it on one plant, I would isolate it. Um, and the last one we'll talk about is the red spider mites. Same kind of damage you would see with regular spider mites. Um, but this is a better picture, actually, of the damage you see. You can kind of see it's dusty and there's that little that pitting kind of in the leaves. Um, that is what both damages will look like, but these ones don't really produce as many webs. So you'll just see these little red dots kind of hanging around on your plant, crawling around. Um, so treatment for these is usually pretty easy. Um, if you have a really big infestation, you might want to make sure you isolate that plant, um, treat it really hard, go maybe do a couple different treatments. Um, any pyrethrin-based um, insecticide will work. Any oil-based insecticide should work as well. Um, the neem oils that I brought in here to kind of show you guys today. Um, just be careful with neem oil and other horticultural oil-based products. They can stain your furniture uh, because it is oil. And so I recommend either putting the plant in a trash bag or in your shower or bathtub or something and then treating it, letting it dry. And then you can just, you know, spray your bathtub out when you're done or throw the garbage bag away when you're done, which is great. Um, mealybugs are, can be a little bit more difficult to remove and scale. What I would do is get a Q-tip and try and just take off as many as possible with um, rubbing alcohol um, and then spray the plant down with um, an oil or an alcohol-based insecticide just to get any that you might have missed. Um, so that's really important that I am going to mention beneficial insects. If you've got lots of houseplants and lots of orchids or you have a greenhouse, um, 
Beneficial insects is something that you might want to look into. They are basically tiny other little bugs that you would release into your house or your greenhouse. And they go and hunt all the pests, which is great. They work great for preventative measures, um, especially in the summer when your windows are open and stuff all the time. Uh, if you release those every couple of weeks, they'll kind of kill and eat anything that happens to fly in before it can really get established and get a population going, which is great. Um, they are not, you know, the best at treating full on infestations just because they have to go hunt. So, you know, doing a mix of the two is helpful. I do that if I, I release them every so often. And then, you know, if I have an infestation of something, I will go treat it separately. Um, so that's something to consider as well. If you've got lots of plants, I wouldn't say it's really worth it for just a couple plants, but if you have a lot of plants, um, they do work really well. I've never had let I've had so many less pest issues recently. It's great. What kind of bug are you? Using? So there's a couple of different types that you can do. I buy mine online from Nature's Good Guys. If you go on there, um, there's like a treat by pest thing. So if you have mealybugs, you can say, I have mealybugs, what are my options? And then they'll give you a bunch of different options that you can use and re you can read about them. Um, it'll be like, this is good for this environment or this environment. So you can kind of pick based so on that. The, the website? Nature's good guys. Nature's good guys. I think also Evergreen Grower Supply is another one that does that. Um, I Generally, I just use them for mites um, and they're, they're beneficial mites. They're called like... Um, a cucumeris, I think is what their Latin name is, uh, but they're tiny other little mites that don't form any webbing and they're really, really difficult to see because they're so small um, and they just go eat all the spider mites and the thrift larva. So it's great um, for that kind of stuff. Uh, fungus gnats can also be an issue for a lot of people for orchids and houseplants in general. Uh, fungus gnats are really hard to avoid in the wintertime here if you've got a lot of plants. Um, and especially in the summer too, if you've got fruit and stuff in the house. Um, what I like to do to treat my houseplants for fungus gnats is we sell this product called Mosquito Bits. Um, a lot of people will use it for their ponds and stuff like that. Um, but you would just dump it in your watering can, let it soak for you know, 20, 30 minutes, and then water all your plants with it. It's a beneficial bacteria, so it's not harmful to you or animals or anyone else in your house. Um, the bacteria will then go into the soil and kill and prevent any egg laying or larva um, development in the soil. And it kind of stops the population at that point. So that's a good way to treat fungus gnats too. And I know a lot of people struggle with those in the winter time. So they also sell those sticky traps. Um, they're like yellow fly paper that the fungus gnats will fly into. That works to get the adults, um, but it will not kill any of the larvae. So that's why I also recommend uh, mosquito bits too. Um, like I said, orchids are kind of prone to root rot just because they like airflow around the roots. They grow on trees and stuff like that. Um, they're also really prone to getting um, leaf and stem rots. Um, so be careful when you water orchids. You really don't want to water in the middle um, or on the stems, uh, especially if it's in your house, because that will get, water will get stuck in there, and it's kind of like a breeding ground for bacteria and other um, pathogens, um, and it can cause some rot. And once you're, especially like on the fan type orchids, once the stem rots, the whole thing goes down. Um, if you've got a couple, you know, if you got some root rot, you just trim it off, you know, repot. Same with the um, cattleyas and the other orchids. You just root rot, you just trim it off, repot. The cattleyas and um, dendrobiums don't really have a problem as much with crown and root rot as the phalaenopsis and the vandas and stuff like that do. But the issue with cattleyas is they will send out a new cane that's really tightly wrapped up like this. And it's just a barely open at the top. And if water gets in there, it's going to get stuck in there and it'll, it'll rot your new growth. But once it's old like this, there's no place for water to just sit or get stuck inside of. So it's not as big of a deal um, when that happens. So just be careful when you have new growth. Um, just be mindful not to get water inside that new growth because they can rot it. I would say also stay away from spraying your flowers with water or any liquid. It's going to cause discoloration. It's going to cause um, spots and pitting on the flowers. It's going to decrease the flower life um, just because it can encourage bacteria to grow. Um, so just be very careful about that as well. When you water orchids when they're blooming, I wouldn't mist or spray the flowers um, just because it can make them drop. Uh, if if you do get water in, you know, in the crown or when you're repotting or something like that, it's really easy just to kind of blow, you know, with your mouth, blow the water out or take a paper towel, take the corner of it and just kind of stick it in to the crown or in the edges just to kind of suck that extra water out. Uh, it's not really that big of a deal. You can put it near a fan or near your heater vent too, just to let it dry out. Um, it happens, especially when you repot and you got to wash it off and stuff like that. Um, you just don't want it sitting in there for extended periods of time. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to talk. I'm just going to move in now to kind of, we're, we're going to look back at this slide. Um, this is just going to be, I'm going to go through a lot of the orchids that you'll see in grocery stores and in nurseries. 
And I'm just going to generally talk about their care because they are a little bit different for each one. Um, you'll see a lot of similarities though, which is great. Um, so for Phalaenopsis, I'm going to start off, you know, with the, the most iconic common grocery store moth orchid that you'll see out there. Um, these orchids are super easy to take care of. They are epiphytic orchids, so they like to grow on trees. I recommend planting them in a bark moss mix. They like to almost completely dry out in between waterings. They don't want to stay wet. Um, they don't want to be bone dry either. So, I mean, once it's approaching dryness, then it's good to give it kind of a rewater. Most people end up watering um, once every week to two weeks. It kind of changes seasonally and based on like your heater and your air conditioning in your house. Um, so just watch it and make sure that the soil is kind of getting close to dry out and then give it a water. Another way you can tell that you've gone a little bit too far with, uh, before watering is the leaves will get super leathery and kind of soft and they bend um, instead of, you know, nice waxy, thick, kind of tough leaves. Um, so that's a really good indicator um, to tell for Phalaenopsis if they need water, if they're super leathery or soft like that. Yeah. So what if they turn a little purple? Is it done or am I... The plant is purple? The leaves. Yeah, that's normal for actually some Phalaenopsis. Um, some Phalaenopsis you'll see are bright green like that one. Some will be, there's ones that are like green and silver um, patterns. There's some that can have purple edges and red edges or purple leaves. If it's soft and mushy, it's probably dead. Okay. If it is, if it looks like this, if it feels like this and there's purple, it just means that generally they're in highlight and it's not a big deal. It's just sometimes they get, they color up kind of in a different situation. Um, temperatures or lighting can do that. I'll show you a picture. Okay. Later. Yeah. We'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. But it is common. Sometimes that does happen. Yeah. So you said when it is kind of leathery or the soft, that's too much water or not enough? Not enough. But here's the thing. If you have root rot, it will do that because it's not getting water. So be considerate if you water it again and it's not, you know, perking back up, um, you might have an issue going on in the root system and it can't actually absorb any water. Okay. Um, you know, leathery soft leaves is an indicator of um, not enough water, but I mean, you could have given it too much and the roots rotted away and now it's not getting any, if that makes sense. Um, so it could be a root issue, but if you water it and it perks back up, it's probably just, um, it just needed water. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Phalaenopsis are actually considered lower light orchids, so they don't really need to be in directly in a window to do well or rebloom, which is um, good to consider because a lot of other orchids do like highlight, and that is a good key to get them to bloom. Um, Phalaenopsis generally like to stay between 60 and 80 degrees, um, but they can handle down to 50 degrees um, if needed. You might, below that, you'll probably see some full damage. Um, some of the leaves will kind of get holes in them or get mushy or rot, um, stuff like that. But usually they pull through. I've had some go down to like 45 because my heater went out one time and um, they powered through. So, but they will see some damage if it goes below 50 degrees. Light and fertilizer are really important um, for flowering, but the real trigger to get these flowers to bloom, to these orchids to rebloom is a temperature drop at nighttime. So in the winter time, they naturally bloom because our houses tend to get colder. Greenhouses will get colder in the winter. Um, we're just not heating stuff as much as we're trying to save energy. So about a 10 degree drop from where it sits during the day at night for you know a month is what, or a couple of weeks is what's gonna trigger it to kind of shoot out that new spike um, and give you new flowers. So um, most people have issues with that because you know their house will stay at a constant temperature. Um, so if you put it up against a window, like right up on that window, it's usually a lot colder kind of in the windowsill. So that will help you. Um, if there's another way that you can provide that temperature drop at night um, with adequate fertilizer, it'll, you know, put on a big show for you. If it's not really getting super fertilized or anything, you know, it could put out a couple flowers, the same thing. But if you really want a maximum blooms, um, fertilizer and the light are really helpful. So um, yeah, like I said, here in Oregon, it's not really as big of a deal because you can just stick it in the window time in the windowsill. You know, you know, around 55 degrees is where you'd want it to sit at night just to kind of um, trigger that blooming. I do want to show you guys too. This one that we've had in the store for a while is actually coming back around to reflower. This is a new spike. Um, we can kind of look at it after class too. But this is a new root forming right here, and then this is what a baby spike will look like. So this this will turn into this. Um, and so that's what they kind of start out like. I'm gonna show our Zoom people as well. Um, let's see here, this is really difficult to do backwards. <laughs> right here is the new spike. Um, and there's roots on the other side of the plant as well. But that's um, what it will begin to look like if it's gonna rebloom. Once you see that, the temperature drop is not really as much of a concern anymore. It's already initiated flowering. 
see if you can kind of bring it back into warmer temperatures and that'll actually make the spike grow faster um, so it'll get blooms faster as well. Um, that's kind of, if you guys have any questions about Phalaenopsis orchids, I'm gonna kind of move on I think now. Um, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, we'll talk about Cattleyas. That's what this is. It's a Cattleya hybrid, intergeneric hybrid, but there's, you can see lots of them. Any of the flowers that look like that um, are gonna be Cattleyas. Uh, I don't know. Oh, this is a Cattleya, this one right here as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, that's actually mine. I'm very, that's what it looked like this year. So, <laughs> um, so these orchids are known for their show-stopping flowers and actually they do tend to be fragrant. This one, that one's not, unfortunately. Um, but a lot of Cattleyas um, are known for really strong, um, sweet fragrances. Um, so that's really a good, in, um, a good trait about those ones. Um, they prefer really good airflow and they like to be warmer and brighter. Um, I would say 65 to 85 degrees, but they can handle down to, you know, 50 to 60. It's not really that big of a deal. They just won't be growing as much when it's cold. Um, these orchids do make good orchids to mount um, because I would, I would also, you know, pot these in mostly bark, not a lot of moss, just because they do like that extra airflow and they're pretty drought tolerant. Um, I would say once the soil dries out completely, then give it a water. Um, don't let it sit for a super long time, but you know, once you notice that it's dry, if you look for any wrinkles in the leaves, like same with the phonopsis, if it's leathery or if the canes on there get wrinkly, that's an indicator that it needs water. Um, it could also be a root problem, like we said earlier, it's the same kind of thing. Um, I would say highlights, so you know, they like to be right in that window. They can usually handle Western and Southern exposure just fine. Um, in the summer, it might get a little too hot if it's not adjusted, but I mean, that orchid that I showed you guys a picture of, I had outside on my porch and it got like direct morning sun and then late afternoon sun and it did fine like all summer. Um, yeah. So that was a question. Mm -hmm. it would, thinking of insects and all that, would you take them in and out? Um, so it depends. Out? Yeah, so you can. Um, I'll talk about that. I would say for Cattleyas and Cymbidiums, a lot of our tougher orchids are good to go outside. I would say Phalaenopsis, probably not, just because the sun and the heat can kind of work them a little bit too hard. Uh, same with Oncidiums, I'd probably keep them inside. But you know, this the that far corner one in the slideshow um, on the right there um, is good outside. A lot of people keep those actually outside almost year round unless we get a hard freeze. Okay. Um, people can grow those outside in San Francisco mm -hmm. too, like on their porch and they do great. They put them in their yards and stuff. So they're a little bit hardier than we think. Um, Cattleyas like the temperature in the summer. I, they like the heat. So, I mean, I did put it outside and it did enjoy it. Um, but you do have to be careful when you bring in about pests and stuff like that. I would just do a thorough check um, of the pests. And then um, you can also pre-treat it if you want to with the, like the oil. That'll kind of prevent anything or kill anything that's already there. Um, but yeah, I would just do a check, but it is it is a concern. So that it, if you put hair house plants outside in the summer, it is a concern that you bring bugs in with them. Uh, I got a question that's asking to show some plants that on the computer, I will, a lot of the pictures that I'm showing is kind of what I'm talking about and just pointing to them on the screen that we've gotten here as well. Um, but the Cattleya is kind of this one right here. I don't, know if, I don't know if they can see my mouse, but I, you guys can, so I think they can. And the Cymbidiums are the ones that are kind of over here as well. Um, and if I bring you more up, I will show you guys. Uh, for Cattleyas reblooming, I would say they prefer, they generally bloom in spring and summer, which is kind of out of the ordinary for a lot of our orchids that we have, um, just because they do like those warm temperatures. Mine bloomed in like August or September this year, um, after it had completed the growth of a new cane. The first one it tried to grow, I watered it in the middle and it rotted. So then it grew another one and then it, and then it flowered. So I was very lucky that it decided to grow another one this year. Um, they generally will grow, you know, a couple, one to two um, per year. But as it gets bigger, it'll be, it'll expand faster. Um, for reblooming, like I said, once that new cane has finished maturing, you should get flowers and they are heavy feeders to like a lot of extra nutrients and fertilizer. So just that's something that you would consider with Cattleyas. They do like, actually, they do like the fertilizer a lot. Um, and it's really important for their blooming. Um, and good light. They do like high light too. If they're in a lower light, they probably won't bloom. So that's something to consider for those guys. Um, dendrobiums are super common. Um, those really tall, skinny looking ones that we've got over here, I'll show the computer people. That also this purple one on the top of the screen. Um, this is the dendrobium that we've got. It's kind of, it's not gonna fit in the screen, but <laughs> this is what it looks like. Um, and then there's also this purple one up here is a dendrobium. Like I said, people use it in lays a lot in Hawaii. Um, they also use them on like salads and cakes as like garnishes. So if you ever see like a really purple flower on, on a cake, it's an orchid, it's the dendrobium orchid probably. 
Um, yeah, they're not poisonous. I wouldn't say that they're edible, though. I don't know. I have tried one, and they just kind of taste like salad. Like, it just tastes like a leaf. So, um, but it's not going to hurt you. That's why they put it on there. But I don't know if they intend for you to eat it. I've never talked to, like, a chef. I should. That'd be an interesting question to ask someone. Um, these orchids are a lot like cat in the way that they like a lot of airflow, and they do like higher light. Um, they grow, they tend to grow in canes. There's two types of work, two types of dendrobiums, the cane ones that we've got in here. Those are called dendrobium phalaenopsis, which is really confusing because this is a phalaenopsis orchid and this is a dendrobium phalaenopsis. It's, they're not the same, uh, but they call them that because they look similar, I guess. Uh, the flowers look kind of similar. I don't really know why it's called that. There's also dendrobium nobly types. The dendrobium nobles are going to be like the phalaenopsis where they like that temperature drop to get the flowers. But the, the dendrobium phalaenopsis that we have in the store that I showed on the screen here um, don't need that temperature drop and they're just fine growing in the house like the Cattleyas are. Um, let's see, 55 and 80 degrees is ideal. They prefer to be watered once the soil is dry like Cattleyas are. Um, look, again, look for wrinkled leaves, wrinkled canes, soft um, leathery leaves for watering if you missed a watering. Um, most dendrobiums for sale that you'll see are the phalaenopsis dendrobium types. Um, they bloom, they rebloom much like a cattleya where once a new cane is mature, they'll shoot out um, a new flower spike um, yearly, generally. They, most of these orchids will bloom once a year. Sometimes you can get once or twice to three times depending on the orchid, but generally it's about once a year for us here, especially with our lighting and stuff in Oregon, they usually only bloom about once a year. Um, good light and fertilizer are important. Dendrobium nobly types, like I said, directly actually will form directly on the cane, like on the, the buds will form like right here instead of shooting out these like long spikes. Um, so if this is like the cane, they'll form like on the cane instead of like a big long flower spike. Um, I wasn't actually gonna talk about these, but we got some in for the class, I'm very excited. Um, the Vanda orchids, this really funky looking one right here. Uh, there's lots of different types and they can get gigantic. Um, I'll show this in the screen here, they look like this. Uh, they tend to grow, um, long roots. Um, we soak these, you know, every couple of days, generally. They like the airflow a lot, but I mean, they don't have a lot of storage, right? Like they don't have any canes and they don't have any bulbs. So they do need water, you know, a little bit more constantly. So if you wanted to put this, like if you've got like a skylight in your shower and you hang it in the shower, that's a really good option for these guys. Um, in the kitchen where you can just kind of dunk it in the sink and let it soak. Um, when we water these, we just let the roots soak you know for about 10 minutes and then you let it drip dry and it'll be fine yeah so you couldn't just spray them you have to soak them uh spraying them can work but it's not a lot of water that you're giving the plant i mean if you're spraying it a lot you know that would be good um but soaking them really allows for that 10 minutes they're sucking up that water that you're giving them once you spray it it'll dry in a couple minutes and the, then the water is gone if that makes sense um so if you've got it out these also do really well outside in the summer here if you hang them under a tree or something like that if you just water them with a hose every day outside um that's a really good way to do it in the winter they won't need as much water just because they're not growing as much it's darker it's more humid yeah. Is this particular plant uh, ready for repotting? Uh, or is That's a really good question as well. Um, vandas are really interesting to repot. I have grown vandas a couple times, and usually what I end up doing is I usually will just take them out of the basket and then just attach something to the stem and then hang them by the stem because it's really difficult to get them out of baskets like this. Um, so I would usually end up having to cut the basket to kind of preserve some of the roots and I just don't put them in anything. Wow. Um, kind of like an air plant where they don't, you know, they don't really need media. But like I said, Spanish moss is really cool accent you can do and that'll help keep the moisture up. Some people grow them in plastic bags, which is really not my favorite look. Um, <laughs> but they will, they'll tie a bag, you know, to the bottom of the plant and it keeps the roots a little bit more humid. Um, so these are really good if you've got a nice, like your bathroom, humid area, kitchen, uh, outside, you can spray it in the summer um, or you have a greenhouse or something like that, they'll do well. Um, the higher humidity is really good for these orchids so they can absorb a little bit more water or if you are committed to soaking it, you know, every day in the summer and every couple days, every, you know, every twice a week in the winter, um, these would be good. And they're, they've got really, really cool, pretty flowers. Um, they come in almost a blue color, actually, which is, it's like one of the closest flowers to blue I've ever seen. Um, it's still a little purple, but it's very, very blue almost. Um, there's blue, there's orange, there's white, there's pink, obviously, there's purple. Um, most of the flowers tend to look like this. Um, and when they, as they get bigger, the flowers can get, you know, you know pretty good size. 
Um, so this is a really cool orchid to have. Um, not, I don't really see these in stores that often. Um, usually you have to buy these online or at an orchid nursery or something like that. So I'm really happy that we got those in. Uh, I don't think that I've, if there's anything else, higher light, I would say, but in the summertime, if you do keep it outside dappled sun, like under a tree, it would be great for those guys. Inside the higher light, I would say. Uh, for oncidiums, we don't have any oncidiums for this class, which I'm really sad about, but they're really common. They're also known for their fragrance. Um, that picture I put in there, uh, but let's see, I'll show you guys with my mouse, actually, and I'm going to have to go over this. This one right here um, is called Sweet Sherry or Sherry Baby. There's two different kinds, and they look very similar. And a lot of people, most people say they look like, van they, most people say they smell like vanilla and chocolate together. And they do. I've had one. They're great. They're awesome. There's also one called Short Sherry, and it stays smaller. Um, it's more compact, but same flowers, same smell. Um, so those are really cool. This one in the bottom left corner here is also more of a, it's an Oncidium type. Um, there's a lot of different ones. There's um, They've been hybridized quite um, extensively, like the Phalaenopsis have. So not all of them even have names. They just kind of put them out in the store. Um, but some of them do, and they're really easy to take care of. They are more moisture-loving orchids than anyone that we've talked about so far. Um, so I would do, you know, 25% bark, 50% moss, and then 25% perlite. So just a little bit more moss than bark for those guys. Um, they have pseudobulbs, so bulbs at the bottom near the soil. Look for if they're wrinkly or if the leaves are soft. The leaves are a lot thinner than most of the orchids that we've looked at because they do have those pseudobulbs. Um, so that's a really good indicator if they need water is wrinkly pseudobulbs. Um, they got really, really thin roots which is, um, can be difficult to repot. So that's why I also recommend moss because thin roots and lots of bark is really, really tedious to kind of separate out. Um, let's see, temperatures are good between 60 and 75. Bright, indirect or direct morning sun is best for these plants. They don't need any hot afternoon sun. They're just fine in a, a nice, well-lit location, maybe some morning sun, like I said. You can find these sometimes in garden centers and in grocery stores. Um, they come in a variety of sizes, ranging from mini oncidiums, which are called twinkles. They're like two to four inches tall, and the flowers are absolutely tiny, and they're super cute. And some can even get like four or five feet tall, like with the flower spikes when they're mature, with, you know, flowers that are this big. So they're quite a big um, variety in the orchid family. Uh, Reblooming happens with the maturity of a new pseudobulb. It'll usually come from the base of the pseudobulb and grow up and around the bulb and then out into the air, um, like a spike, like well, a lot of these plants. And they are big clusters generally of flowers is how those will um, rebloom. Um, a slight temperature drop can help in reblooming just because it signals of a change of season. Um, but it's not necessary. And I would say fertilizer and proper lighting is important to get these guys to rebloom. Um, if you have a healthy orchid and it's not reblooming, I would say, you know, try the temperature drop thing, make sure you're fertilizing it, um, and then it should rebloom. But I mean, if, if, if you, if it's not healthy, I we don't expect flowers right away. It's kind of a good, important thing. You might have to kind of rehab something, especially from like a home improvement store or a grocery store. Uh, let's see. They can also bloom multiple times a year, which is great. The pseudobulbs don't always take a year to flower or to, to mature, I mean. Um, so at the maturity of a new suitable, it can happen a couple of times a year, you'll get flowers generally. So that's also a really cool trait about oncidiums. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is slipper orchids. Those ones, those really funky looking ones in the top corner, um, these guys right here. Um, they come in a variety of colors, shapes, sizes. Um, there's a couple of different species types. Um, there's papiopetalums and phragmopidiums and cypripidiums. There is a hardy version of this orchid that's native to the United States called Cypripidium, and you can actually grow those outside here in your yard. Um, but you can grow, these are the tropical versions. This is called a bulldog, Um, It's a really, it's just a name for a hybrid um, line that a grower came up with basically. Um, there's also Madier types, um, which means the leaves are like variegated almost. They're, you know, lighter green and darker green squares and patterns all over them. Um, it's not shown in this picture. This is just a normal green leaf right here. Um, but they are more, the Madier types tend to be more compact. They're a fan orchid, but they clump. So they, every time they shoot out a new growth, it'll just be like a little new fan and it kind of clumps and gets bigger over time. Um, they will bloom at the maturity of a new fan. So it'll come out the center of the where the crown is of the of the flower and it'll bloom the spikes can be like this tall they're kind of funky looking it'll be like this plant is down here and then all of a sudden there's a big one big flower right up here so they're really cool to look at um usually the flowers are super intricate and sometimes they even have little hairs on them um the roots are fuzzy 
So that's really cool, but also it's really irritating when you're trying to repot and the fuzz has attached itself to the bark. Um, so again, soaking is really important because it will kind of loosen those roots up. It'll swell the roots in the bark. Um, it'll kind of release the fuzz a little bit on those guys. Um, let's see here. A lot of people speculate because the they're trying to figure out why it looks like that because most flowers obviously don't look like that. They think that it's to get the pollinator for it inside the pouch and stuck in there. It's really slippery and waxy on the inside. Um, and so they get stuck and you just kind of run around a bunch of times to make sure it gets pollinated and then they'll fly away. Um, so that's why they think that it looks like that. Um, they do best in moderate temperatures, 55 to 75 degrees, bright indirect light. They don't need any direct sun. They're more understory terrestrial orchids like an oncidium. So they like to kind of grow under trees on the ground in leaf litter, um, stuff like that. Um, they do benefit from a little extra humidity. So, you know, ideally you could get like a humidifier or you put it in your bathroom or near your kitchen sink or something like that. But a lot of our, the ones you find in grocery stores usually are fine in general house humidity, especially here in the winter time. A lot of people have really humid houses just because it's humid outside here. Um, so they're usually okay. And sometimes in the summer, just make sure you're watering them. They can get a little fussy if it gets too hot or really dry. Um, so just make sure you're keeping up on the watering with those guys. Um, Reblooming will generally occur. Uh, Reblooming occurs generally yearly with the maturity of a new fan. So as it you know grows a new growth, um, and it'll clump over time. That new growth will be what flowers, and then the old ones will never flower again. Um, don't cut them off or anything. I would leave them on because they are still photosynthesizing and providing energy to the plant. It's all connected by the root system, um, so it is important to kind of keep those. Uh, I got a question on Zoom: How many hours of light are needed for orchids to rebloom? Um, depends on the orchid. Like I said, cattleyas, vandas, they like, you know, more full sun, um, you know, four to six hours of, um, you know, bright light. Um, Oncidiums, papiopetalums, um, phalaenopsis orchids are going to be lower light orchids. So just bright indirect light in your house would be great. Um, morning sun is fine. Um, there's not really specific light, like, you don't. they don't need specific hours of direct sun. Um, but as long as they're in a very well-lit location, um, that should be good for the lower light ones. Um, fertilizer also really helps with keeping um, the fan, the papiopetalums, the fans to grow faster and for the blooms to, um, for it to bloom as well. So fertilizer is really good for that. Cymbidiums, I said, I mentioned a little bit earlier, we talked about these, these guys over here in the corner, kind of um, bottom corner here, that really big pink flower that's on the screen. Um, very large flowered orchids. They're really common in flower arrangements. They're really common in um, corsages and boutonnieres just because the flower is really sturdy and um, heavy. Um, they can have a slight fragrance. It's usually not super full, but I do tend to see these a lot in like Home Depot and like new seasons during the winter time. Um, so if you're looking for a cymbidium, now is the time I would say to look for them um, in the grocery store. Uh, during the growing season, they can handle a variety of temperatures and they're somewhat drought tolerant because they've really got big um, chunky pseudobulbs at the soil. Um, they are terrestrial orchids, so a little bit more moisture, a little bit less bark. Um, like I said, people will literally plant these in their yards in San Francisco, and they do fine. Um, that, that cool down is what keeps them blooming, so I like to keep them outside until we get a really hard freeze, then, then you can bring them inside, and that should be enough to kind of trigger um, blooming. Um, they do need that cool down for the bloom. Um, they need a period of dormancy, like I said, for the colder weather. So, you know, low 50s, high 40s. They don't really want to go below 45, I would say, um, or 40. Just be careful. They just don't want to freeze. Um, but if you can stay, you can keep them outside for a long time. Um, and that'll encourage the flowers. And they are also heavy feeders because they're such big plants. Um, they do like a lot of extra fertilizer. Um, jewel orchids, I mentioned those earlier. We don't have any today. Um, they're mainly grown for their foliage and their glitter leaves. They're really pretty. They tend to like higher humidity. Um, a lot of the Ludicia discolor, those purpley ones I was talking about, will get in. They don't need the extra humidity, but if you see any, I think the genus is called Macotis. Yeah, they're really little tiny orchids and they're green and they're really sparkly. They like a little bit higher humidity, so just be aware of that. Um, they can be grown in potting soil or moss mixtures. They like to stay between 60 and 80 degrees. Bright indirect light is good for those. Canes and roots are very, very brittle. So be careful when you're repotting them because they just snap. You like breathe on it and it snaps. So just be super careful. It's really frustrating. I literally repotted one. My first time I repotted one, I didn't know that. And I was left with like two canes. And I was like, what did I just do? Um, sometimes you can reroute them though. So just let them dry out and try and reroute them if that happens. Um, but just be aware of that. 
Flowering generally occurs in the maturity of a cane, like most of our orchids that we've talked about, and it can be influenced by regular fertilizer, but like I said, their flowers aren't super showy or big or significant, so they don't need a lot of energy to do it as much. They're just kind of little white, dainty flowers, um, so it's not really as a much of a concern as for like cattleyas and cymbidiums for fertilizer. Um, vanilla orchids are where, like I said, vanilla bean comes from, which is really cool. They like it very warm. Um, 60, they don't really want to go below 65. They'll stop growing and they'll kill their growth to below 60. Um, so 65 to 85 is ideal for temperature and they do like extra humidity. Um, these orchids can get really big because they're a vine. So, I mean, if you can trellis it or something, um, they would appreciate that. We've got that one growing on a stick. Um, a lot of our growers will just put a stick in there and they attach themselves in the higher humidity environments. So that something like that, just to give it support. If it's not supported, it's not going to grow very quickly and it's probably not ever, ever sorry, not ever going to flower. Um, they can be trimmed really easily and propagated because they are a vine. It's just like a normal, um, if you've ever had Hoyas or something like that, it's kind of like that um, really succulent plant. Um, let the cutting dry and then you can try and reroot it in moss um, later on. That's what I would suggest for those guys. Um, what else? They're really cool house plants and the vine itself is actually really like attractive. I think they're really pretty. The new growth is really cool. Um, you can get variegated versions. They're really pretty. There's like white stripes in the leaves. So that's a really cool option as well. Um, let's see. I would say a, a small bark and moss mixture. There's two different types of bark that I haven't mentioned. There's seedling orchid bark and normal or medium, I think is what it's called. Seedling is in that darker blue bag and then the medium is there. If you want something that's for more terrestrial orchids, moisture loving, um, seedling orchid bark is better uh, because it's smaller. So there's less spaces for air um, and it keeps a little bit more moisture. Um, so if you're gonna use bark when you're potting up terrestrial orchids, the seedling orchid bark is good. For cattleyas, dendrobiums, stuff like that, I would keep the, I would use the medium orchid bark. Um, for vanillas, they are heavy feeders just because they grow so fast and they get really big. Um, they need to be at least three feet tall or long to flower before you can even think about getting a flower. So just remember that they can be hard to get to flower in your house. Um, they'll do fine. They'll grow still. But, you know, if they if they don't have the extra humidity and they're not really warm, it's kind of hard for them to flower sometimes. And fertilizer can encourage that, but um, they're a little bit more difficult to flower. And they usually only get one or two flowers and that big one in that in the back corner of kind of appears of is what the flower looks like. They can be more white or more yellow like that one. Um, but that's what they tend to look like and they're very fragrant as well. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about you with you guys today um, is just like if you go to a, a grocery store, like which one do you pick? Um, how do you know which one's healthy and which one's not? I feel like that's something that people kind of struggle with. Um, like I said, looking for really nice, thick you know, um, stiff foliage, nothing that's leathery or soft is really important. Um, you can, a lot of times you can see roots from orchids either growing out of the pot or at the top of the pot. Um, if the root, you know, looks healthy, it's not papery, it's not peeling, it doesn't look rotted. Um, that's a good indicator that the roots are good and the plant looks healthy. Um, that's an indicator that the roots are probably in a good, in good shape as well. Um, a lot of our orchids um, that you'll see in grocery stores will be put in potting soil. Um, which can be bad for the roots. So, I mean, if you have the option to pick between one that's in orchid bark and moss versus potting soil, I'd probably go with the one in orchid bark and moss. It's just going to be probably healthier and you're going to have less issues come, going into that. Um, looking for orchids that either have, you know, unopened buds or a flower spike that's still forming is going to be the best for the longevity of flowers in your house if you want that, if you're buying one that's about to bloom. So be considerate of that. Um, if it's still got some buds left, like these couple here, that they're going to last longer, it's just getting started, if that makes more sense. Um, I think looking for pests is a good thing to look for as well, because you meet a lot of times in Home Depot and stuff, they don't really care about that kind of thing. Um, and so looking for, you know, pest damage, actual bugs, um, stuff like that is really important. And I would say, what what, what do the other plants around them look like? Are they flooded? Are they being sprayed with water all the time? <laughs> just kind of, you know, looking at the surroundings and how they treat their plants is also, I would say, really important. Um, a lot of times in like Trader Joe's and stuff, they don't water their orchids until like they just don't water them. So um, looking to see um, if it's just dehydrated or if it's got a root issue or something like that um, is all things to consider. But if the plant looks healthy and you've got new buds that haven't opened yet, I would say it's probably a pretty good to go ahead and get that one, if that makes sense. Um, 
I think that's all I have to talk about today. If you guys have any questions, you can ask right now. The Zoom people, feel free to ask questions too. Um, I'll be here. Just, I'm going to stick around and we can talk about some specific stuff if you guys need anything as well. So, yeah. I have a question. When you do need to refi, mm -hmm. um, is there preparation that you need to do for the bark? And I think when I did it last time, I mean, I soaked the bark in yeah. water. Mm -hmm. is, is that you can do that a lot. Some people prefer to do that. I don't normally. It's just not, to. you don't need to. Um, but make sure you water it when you're done because if the media is super dry, um, the if the media is super dry the issue is that it will suck water out of the plant it'll actually suck water out of the roots so i do tend to wet my moss before i use it but the bark it's not as big of a deal so make sure you water it um, after you repot it mm -hmm. the perlite how how important is that for it's not super important um if especially if you're using less moss if you're planting something though directly in moss I would use perlite just because moss will compact over time and it'll um become super not airy at all it might look airy when you repot it but over time it'll kind of smush together um so the perlite keeps extra air pockets in there which helps it also promotes longevity of the moss too because if the moss is super compacted and it's staying wet in the middle it's going to go bad faster um so the air that's flowing through the perlite is going to help keep it lasting longer if that makes sense yeah <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yes, I would say. <laughs> so this is actually a good example right here. If I, if you don't mind, yeah. I'm going to show okay. some people. So a lot of our grocery store orchids will come in these really cheap looking mm -hmm. flimsy plastic pots. Um, I would not reuse this. Um, they're super irritating and mm -hmm. they will fall over. They're not flat. They're flimsy. Um, this is also a good example of what happens when you just use moss it gets super super compacted mm -hmm. there's no air in there at all it's just like a flat it's just a block of moss basically um and so the issue with that i would you know go through clean out all the moss and then make a potting mix with bark and then the moss together um and then repot it into a bigger pot because the roots are super full you can tell it's pushing on that pot it's really stiff um you guys can't feel that but it's really stiff and there's lots of roots in there so uh upsizing the pot would be helpful too uh -huh. and yeah. you don't those and stuff. not not the plastic ones we have those nice ceramic ones um but we should get some plastic ones um this week you can also buy them on amazon so they're just called look up like their orchid pot or something like that okay yeah. so i need uh, fighting like kind of soil and fat yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and then you would just kind of take out all the old media and then you know mix it together and then fill okay. it in right there um that's really cool yeah i also want to mention for you too, you that's true we, we can do it here too if you want to pay like a fee for us we will we can walk you through it or we can just do it if you don't okay. want to so Sounds good. i also yeah. want to mention too really quickly this brings up a good point if you are looking at a phalaenopsis and you see these little kind of buds on the stem here um this guy oops sorry this one right here i'm going to show the zoom people too um there's like a little bud or an, uh, a node is what it's called on the stem if you kind of have some here, but they're just a little bit dry, they're dried out. So they're not useful anymore. But if they are still green or the same color as the stem, you can actually, when your flowers drop, cut it right there. And it'll actually um, initiate a new flower stalk to grow out of there. So you can actually prolong the flowers to do that. But once the whole stem is dried out or once the nodes are dry, there's no use for it anymore. And you can just cut it at the base of the plant. So, so. this as well can be yeah. at the uh -huh. base? Yeah. And hopefully it will... Yeah, it'll shoot out a new one. Yeah. <laughs> I have some questions on Zoom too. The, is the handout available online? It will be um, eventually. This class will also be recorded and put online, but we will put the handout on our website at some point. And someone also asked, um, how often do you water your orchid? Trust your orchid's going to be watered probably about once a week, once a week and a half, depending on the season. Uh, epiphytic ones are going to be watered a little bit more um, because they dry out a lot faster. So just once the plant is, you know, for epiphytic orchids, once the plant's approaching dryness, um, make sure that it's um, then you can water it and then the the terrestrial ones once they're um, getting close to dry but not fully you can water those as well. Is there one of those foods you recommend the other? Um, I use this version for my houseplants and it works. I've never tried the orchid one. Uh, I I do like this brand. I've never tried it, but I do like the company. It's organic, so uh, there's no chemicals or anything in it. It also helps prevent soft buildup, which is great. Um, but you use the other one. That's the orchid food too. You use. I use a slow. I use a slow release fertilizer. We don't have any slow release orchid fertilizer here, unfortunately. Um, and I do a liquid in the summer, so I will use that liquid in the summer. Um, and then slow. And then a slow release in the spring. I'll put it in there. I was wondering, 
the one that the woman needed uh, repotted, yeah. would you trim the roots at all? If they're dead, if they're like, we've like, I think I showed that picture. I'll go back and look at it really quick. So this picture here on the right, this is what a dead root looks like. It's really papery, really soft, mushy. Um, this stuff, these weird looking thin lines are dead roots that have lost the outer covering. So I would cut those off. But anything that's alive, like this right here, I would leave. Um, you don't trim any living roots. There's really no ever need to. Um, just feel and trim off any dead ones. Yeah. Any other questions? And brown doesn't necessarily mean. You're right. Brown does not necessarily mean dead. Sometimes they're stained. Sometimes the roots are just brown. Um, so feel it. If it's if it's um, squishy, it's probably done. Yeah. So anything else? I have a little question. Yeah. You have a bunch of air plants here. Are they also related to orchids? They are epiphytes. So they grow very similarly to orchids where they grow on trees um, like that. I just brought them in here for display and they're good companion plants. People put them like, people will put them kind of like this in their pots or on, you know, with the Vanda, that one, that thing I was talking about was actually an air plant. Um, oh, okay. So same kind of thing. Um, so how about the Hoya? Is that also part Hoya of Hoya is not part of this. Oh. Um, they're their own thing, but they, they grow like vanilla orchids do, so it's just kind of like why I brought that up. So, yeah. So, the vanilla one, you have it on a uh, stick. Are there any indoor houseplants that you could couple an orchid with to grow, or no? Yes and no. Bromeliads, you could. Have you seen those, like the big flowering, funky looking? Um, I don't even know how to describe the name it. Sounds familiar. Yeah, it's like a, it's, yeah, yes, exactly. They've got like a center, oh, okay. they're green on the outside and a big red purple or pink thing in the middle you can grow those together air plants um you can sit on the pot like that or in on the roots like i said with the spanish moss that's an air plant or you can even put air plants in the spanish moss or something like that but there isn't really a whole lot that grows with them unless it's a, like a super terrestrial worker like if it's in if it if it can handle potting soil then you could put something together like the jewel orchids and stuff but they do really like if it can grow in the bark with the orchid then it should be fine okay. yeah so but coupling plants together though can increase your pest possibility. So just be aware of that too. So, all right, if there's not anything else, uh, these are for sale. They're also gonna go back in the store here really quickly. Um, and there's a couple more in the store as well. So feel free to shop around. That coupon, I forgot to put this in our Zoom meeting group chat, but that coupon is available um, to use today only. And it's also available online. Um, so if you wanna go home and shop online, you can do that too and we'll pick it up or have it delivered. Um, but yeah, just show them so that them as a register and they'll scan it for you. It'll be 10% off your purchase today. So yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah.